We'll have two chairs. First of all, uh, first lady first, uh, Professor Silvana Peretta, uh, who is uh, working in IRCAD, and uh, Professor Bernard Dalmagne. Uh, they will chair. And we have two moderators. I think that we can see them. Two little, uh, little young doctors. On peut les voir. OK, Rita, Dr. Rita Rodriguez from Mexico and Dr. Maria Vanucci from, uh, from Italy. So uh, I think that today what I want to show to you is, first of all, uh, we were absolutely surprised by the success of this webinar because uh, you see that you are today uh, 4,800 participants coming from uh, 138 different countries. So uh, that was a subscription because it is free of charge. We know that perhaps a part of you, you are not connected, but uh, that is the number of subscription we have today. I have to explain why uh, IRCAD organized uh, a webinar about artificial intelligence and surgery. Because, uh, you know, majority of people, you know IRCAD because IRCAD is a very big uh, training uh, center for minimal invasive surgery since uh, more than 27 years. And uh, we know that we have uh, all the equipment, uh, interactive auditorium, we have a, a, an experimental lab for laparoscopic surgery, we have uh, an experimental lab with uh, 13 uh, robot Da Vinci, and we are going to have uh, uh, six more from Medtronic, four from Cambridge Medical. So it is a, a center, but we have also education and artificial intelligence because we have web search, uh, virtual university on internet, uh, uh, and uh, that is uh, the conventional web search uh, moving now more and more for pre precision education with uh, the support of artificial intelligence. Uh, why uh, why uh, we, we, we like uh, artificial intelligence and new technology? I have to confess that that was uh, more than uh, 30 years ago. I attended an exceptional lecture. Always I start my lecture by that, given by Rick Satava, colonel of the US Army, surgeon. And you imagine that in 1991, he explained the future of surgery. And uh, it was a success of internet, of robotic, of virtual reality, but also artificial intelligence. That was in 1991. And we know that artificial intelligence is not, uh, not so recent because the first machine learning uh, was created in 1957. But when I discussed with a computer scientist of IRCAD and I asked why, why it was so long uh, to have really uh, to believe in that, it was because at this period, uh, we had a low processing power, few data, and nobody believed in the concept. And we, we had to wait uh, uh, 2014 when for the first time a machine was a winner against uh, the world champion of Go game. And that was really the beginning of an enthusiasm for this technology. So just when we speak about artificial intelligence, we, we need to understand what is intelligence, first of all. That is the definition of intelligence. And here I put three, uh, three definitions. The first one is the Oxford Dictionary. You see it's the ability to acquire and apply knowledge and skills. Uh, don't speak about uh, military, political, etc. But the, the most important is the, from the Latin, because it is inter 
plus leggere. That was given by one and our co-worker from Italy. And that means reading inside. And when I speak with a computer scientist, his definition is how efficient we, we learn. So you, you, you understand the definition. To understand what is artificial intelligence, I think the first thing is to understand how, because it mimics the human brain, it is to understand what is the strength of the human brain. Three property. One is uh, individual units, a lot, that the neurons. The second one is the strength of connection. And the third one, it's because it is hierarchical. And for that, you see that we have 37 trillion body cells which are able to do 10 to the power of 13 operations per second. So the machine, it's exactly the same. It is a neural network, neural network with a lot of different layers. And that will be explained by uh, uh, Toby, uh, Toby Colling just, uh, just after that. What I want to say is how we can imagine uh, to, to use artificial intelligence in the development of surgery. And we know that uh, we, we work in aircraft since nearly the beginning about the concept of augmented surgery. And augmented surgery, it's augmented vision, it is augmented end, that is robotics, and it is augmented the brain for the decision making to improve the decision making. And when we look uh, how artificial intelligence is important in the vision, it's augmented of vision. We have to, to see the example of one spin-off of IRCAD, which is visible patient. You see that visible patient, we can have a 3D reconstruction of an organ before an operation. And when we see it, just as an example, because it is for all the organ, but when we see that in 2019, to do the total reconstruction of the lung with the bronchus, with the vein, with the arteries, it was four hours of semi-automatic work. And that uh, you see in 2020, and that was also due to the COVID, nine minutes with two new algorithms of artificial intelligence with a European patent and with a US, uh, US patent. So you imagine from four hours to nine minutes, that means that in the next five years, when we speak with the CEO of visible patient, he imagine that it will be some second or really in real time. So that is really a, an example. The second example is, for example, uh, uh, what you have on the market by uh, Medtronic, the system Genius. You have also one in Olympus, and I know another one in Canada. That is a possibility today to have an automatic polyp detection and the classification. Without artificial intelligence, that would have been totally impossible. One word about the hand, that is a robotic, but today it's a prehistory of robotics because we know that integration, for example, of image in the system of robotics will be very important. So what you have seen just before, the 3D reconstruction in some minutes by visible patient, integration of the robot, and that is an intelligent robot. For augmented brain, just one example of uh, what artificial intelligence can do in an operating room. That was a project, a common project with the ERSU of Strasbourg. That is a control tower. How today we can uh, have the acquisition of uh, pre-operative image, uh, external camera, laparoscopic camera, all the signals of the, the anesthesiologist. And we can follow after that the patient until he will be back to, to work. So to finish, to say that all that we are able to do because we have a strong team in IRCAD, of, that the name is Surgical Data Science Team, uh, not only in France, because uh, we have a lot of contact with, uh, due to the IRCAD in uh, Taiwan and the IRCAD in Africa. And we know that especially in Africa, they are very, very strong in artificial intelligence uh, in Kigali. And uh, that is the fact that a project like that is a a global project. Uh, we have today uh, seven different IRCAD in the world. And uh, especially, uh, I want to show two examples uh, to finish. One is uh, IRCAD Africa, who is going to be finished uh, at the end of this year. I think it will be September of October. And they have in Kigali uh, two very important units of uh, artificial intelligence. One is uh, uh, subsidiary of uh, Carnegie and Mellon University of Pittsburgh. The other one is the uh, African Institute of Mathematical and Science. And they have 2,000 candidates for 80 uh, places. So you imagine how we can have brilliant researchers. 
And uh, I have another example uh, because uh, we just started the construction of uh, IRCA China and IRCA China will be for education, but also uh, in collaboration with a lot of research in China about surgery and artificial intelligence. So thank you very much for your attention. That was perhaps a little long uh, introduction, just to explain why IRCAD is interested by this kind of, uh, of uh, uh, subject. You will have a lot of different lectures. And uh, I want to, to give the floor to one of our chairman, uh, Bernard Dalmain, Professor Dalmain, to introduce the next speaker with Toby, uh, Toby Collings. Okay. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jack. Uh, brilliant introduction, as usual. Uh, gives you a, an overview of uh, IRCAD and uh, the aims of IRCAD and the, 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 the methods and all the uh, different uh, topics that are currently developed at IRCAD. Um, I will share this session with uh, Silvana Peretta. Everybody knows Silvana. Uh, and uh, I will continue this session by introducing a uh, good friend, uh, good friend Toby Collins. Toby, Toby Collins is a computer engineer, if I'm right. Uh, uh, mostly uh, is uh, the uh, head of the uh, AI department here at IRCAD. And Jack has shown you this beautiful open space for the uh, data uh, science, I would say. Um, so uh, I know very well Toby because we are used to work on uh, different programs using uh, AI in, uh, in education. Uh, so that's my pleasure uh, to introduce you to Toby. And uh, Toby will talk about the fundamentals of artificial intelligence. And I think that we all need that. So thank you, Toby, for sharing with us. Uh, you can, can remove your mask. Yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, um, um, hello, I'm very happy to be here to talk about the AI fundamentals. Um, I'd like to. Um, I'd like to motivate this talk actually by uh, the survey that we set up uh, in preparation for this uh, webinar. It's been a really fascinating survey and we've been asking questions about really about the level of understanding and expectations of artificial intelligence from, from, from surgeons, you. And one of the questions we asked is, do you think AI will impact your job as a surgeon? And in fact, um, only about 5.7% uh, of you said no, uh, the rest said yes. And 75.5% said uh, yes for the better. 15.7% uh, said yes, but um, maybe uh, it will change my job and I fear that. And um, uh, a, a small minority said uh, it may replace my job. So we have these, uh, this, is a, this is a very, very significant uh, uh, piece of information, but 75% um, of you said you didn't really know the fundamental AI concepts. So this is a real major problem. And my job is to try to get this to 0% in this little talk. Um, so, uh, AI is an extremely broad concept and it's it's often quite hard to define. Um, we we uh, one, one nice way of doing it is to define it in terms of narrow, general and super AI. So narrow AI is, is where we train computers to uh, perform specific tasks um, uh, on specific problems. And we know what tasks we want to solve and we set it up so that they solve their tasks by supplying usually with data. Um, their, their performance can exceed uh, human ability on this. And really this is where pretty much all of AI is today. Um, there is this other notion of general AI where um, the computer will solve any problem that us humans can do, even ones that we haven't even thought of told it to do explicitly. That is by most um, opinions quite far away. And we don't know if we have the correct methods to do that or in fact the uh, computational infrastructure to do that. And after that becomes super AI, which is where the computer just completely outperforms us. Um, really the difference between general and super AI are quite close. If we ever achieve general AI, super AI is really on the heels and then we're all a bit doomed. But luckily this is not where we are today. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk um, uh, explain some of the general concepts with a, a brief walkthrough. I find this the, the this is the easiest way to explain some some of these concepts. I could have chosen uh, uh, an AI example from any one of these stages, but I've chosen diagnostics simply because it's easier to explain. And the, but the general concepts actually apply to all of these stages. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to specifically talk about some narrow AI tools that we all use, and in particular machine learning, which is where we do narrow narrow AI by learning from data. 
Um, then neural networks, which is a particular type of machine learning where our computational models are designed um, to mimic in, in a rough sense the, the human brain. And then we have deep learning where we scale up these uh, neural network models to, to, a, to a large or deep size. So the example I'm gonna select is melanoma recognition. Okay, so the task is uh, we have an image. We'd like to, the, the machine to classify if it's uh, melanoma, malignant or benign. I'm choosing this example also because it was one of the um, examples from Estevar in 2017 where the machine actually outperformed the uh, skilled dermatologist. So what do we really want to do? Um, well, we want to take this image, which is really just a collection of pixels with RG, red, blue, and green values. We want to input that into a computer program and we want the program to make a decision. So either malignant or benign, but not only that, we'd also like to give it, make it some sort of justification. So why did it make that choice? Um, and uh, nearly all the, all the articles you read or the news reports, it, uh, re they, they report results on decision accuracy. Uh, and in fact, justification is, is, is harder, but it's, it's quite important to ensure trust in the AI system. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about three versions. Uh, one very simple where we, don't do the, where we do this without any AI, a second version where we use some machine learning and a third version where we use deep learning. So we may get some inspiration, of course, there's the ABCD rule, and this is uh, very well known. So let's try and program that. So what we would do is we would um, take our image of the, um, uh, the lesion, and we may try to extract um, the ABCD uh, criteria. So we may try to make a program which uh, computes the contour of the lesion. And from this, we can work out if it's asymmetric or how big it is. So we need a computer program to extract that information. And then this goes into a second step, which is to make a decision. And we may try to consider some rules. So if the asymmetry is less uh, greater than 70% and the border uh, irregularity is less than 50%, then it's malignant. So I think people tried this uh, a, long, a long time ago, but unfortunately it's extremely time consuming and complex to program and very difficult. And uh, the, the rules always have exceptions, uh, which makes this very fragile and it doesn't work in, in reality. So now we're going to introduce some machine learning into this process. We're gonna keep the first step, which is extracting these features, but then we're gonna automatically uh, get the machine to make a, a good decision on uh, whether it's malignant or benign. And we can visualize this uh, by considering the asymmetry and border regularity features. And what should happen is that the malignant images, they should kind of cluster where, we where they have high asymmetry and um, uh, high or low uh, regularity of the border. And so what we're looking for the machine to do is to work out what a, what a nice line is that divides those and then it solves the problem. So how do we implement that? Well, we can implement that using a neural network and don't be afraid of this because they're actually really quite simple. Um, so what we have is we have these features coming in and these are just numbers on the left and we're gonna create a score on the right. And if the score is positive, we're gonna say it's malignant or if it's negative, we say it's benign. Now this score is just a very simple mathematical function where what we do is we take these individual features and we add them, but we add them in a weighted way. And this, this is what these weights are, weight one, two, three, and four. And the weights signi signify the importance of each feature. Now this, believe it or not, is a neural network, even though it's extremely small and simple. And it's, it's specifically called a linear neural network, but it is a neural network. And learning a neural network is, is the same as saying training it. And this is exactly the same as saying, what are the good weights? We need to find the good weights to solve the problem. So when we train a neural, ne neural network, we need to supply it with training data. And this uh, is really a trial and error process. Um, so we supply it with images, malignant and benign, but we also need labels and they can come from pathology. And this is what the M and uh, B stand for. What we do is we start off with our neural network and it's untrained, so the weights can be random at the beginning. And we pass in the, those images and we, and we get this uh, little mathematical function to make a prediction. It may make really bad predictions at the beginning because it's not trained. But what we do is because we know the labels, we know where it made mistakes. And so we can make slight adjustments to the weights to improve its performance. So it correctly classifies the training data. So this really you should think of supervised learning as a, like a trial and error process. And that's what we do to train these neural networks. We do it with trial and error like this. So what happens is we may um, take uh, one of the lesions which was misclassified, slightly change the weights to make sure it was cl correctly classified and then repeat the process. Here we've uh, correctly classified four out of the five lesions and there's one left to go. And so we need to make a final weight adjustment to correctly classify all of them. Now you would consider this neural network trained and it's ready to use in production. 
there's a bit of a caveat, which is often when we train these neural networks, we, we know it works well on our training data, but whether it works on our test data, perhaps gathered from a different hospital is a whole nother issue. Um, there are some limitations to this approach, however, and that's we don't know if we've extracted the best features. Um, we, 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 this first process, we are, we are extracting features based on some heuristics um, by dermatologists, but maybe they're not the optimal ones. And maybe we can find better ones automatically. I would also say that when we consider more complicated problems, like for example, um, this is an image from a uh, colon anastomosis. Uh, and if we wanted the machine to recognize if this anastomosis would leak, well, how on earth would we uh, think of what are the right features to do that? It's extremely complicated. And uh, in fact, we may not be able to do this from a single image. We need, may need a video to do it. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna give up on trying to think of what the best features are. And this is the sort of philosophy of deep learning. We take, I'm gonna go back to the, the skin cancer example, and we're going to drop the idea of fi us um, sort of hand programming the good features. We're gonna get the machine to automatically learn what the good features are and to make the decision. Now, this is uh, me down at the bottom putting my feet up because that makes uh, the computer scientists job much, much easier because they're not having to program these, this feature extraction themselves. We're gonna get the machine to do it. And this uh, is actually much more robust in general and, and more accurate. So, uh, when we train a deep neural network, the, the concept is really, really similar. Uh, we've, we've removed the uh, features that we hand designed, and now we're going to hook up uh, each one of these pixels from my image straight to the first layer of my neural network. I'm going to add some more layers into my neural network uh, uh, as well, but the, the, the concept is the same. They just pass information down the neural network by simply a weighted combination of signals. And then finally, we make a decision at the end. Um, the, the concept is that the, uh, the features um, which uh, help, uh, which will solve this problem, get learned and they are encoded in the weights, okay? So when we train our deep neural, ne neural network, that is what we call deep learning. And this really is about finding the good weights. And believe it or not, the process is pretty much identical to what I showed you before. We have training data, we pass it through the neural network. We evaluate its performance and we update the weights to maximize its performance and we iterate and repeat until it doesn't get any better. And that's how we do it. So um, deep learning uh, and deep neural networks, they really do scale up. So I've shown you small neural networks, but here's a visualization of neural networks for doing character recognition, but they get much, much bigger. They may have millions of parameters to train, but that's okay. And thankfully we have tools to do this, which make the programming skills quite low nowadays to be able to train these things. Uh, libraries like TensorFlow and PyTorch exist, which makes, makes this much, much easier. And it's really democratized deep learning. Um, also good designs have emerged for what a, what a good neural network pattern should be. And so whenever you hear the word convolutional neural network, that's actually a type of neural network, which is specifically good at uh, recognizing visual patterns. Um, deep, deep learning is now applied to basically every AI task, uh, all sorts of different modalities, speech, image, video, audio, all this stuff. It's phenomenally successful in general. What I want to do is I want to conclude my talk by saying that the success and limits of deep learning can really be summarized by this graph. Um, so when I showed, talked earlier about um, us having uh, the first approach where we say, I'm gonna design some features and then I'm gonna have some machine learning to work out what the good rules are. This is represented by the red curve called traditional machine learning. And what happens is as you add more data, uh, you do get an improvement in performance, but it tends to saturate and uh, you don't get any better and it's limited by a hand designed features. Now what happens is when we introduce um, deep learning, uh, we do much, much better with data. And what we mean by a shallow neural network is when we don't have so many hidden layers, but as we go to a medium size or deeper, we have more and more layers, the network has more capacity to learn and it does much, much better with data, okay? Now this is all brilliant because it's scaling much better. So um, it means that with more training data, we end up with much, much better performance than the classical methods. However, it is also, it's kind of Achilles heel a bit because we require a lot of data to train. And pretty much um, all the research effort on nowadays is on how do we make uh, training these things more efficient in terms of data? How do we, uh, how can we train them with less labeled data? This kind of thing. And so if you ever hear terms like unsupervised learning or weekly supervised learning, this is all about trying to reduce the amount of data to get the same level of performance. I'll just finish uh, my talk by saying, 
um, the shape of these curves is really, really important, actually. And whenever I speak to a doctor uh, and they come up to me with a problem, they say, can I solve my problem with uh, deep learning? They always ask, uh, uh, well, they ask me how much data do I need to solve the problem? And really what I'd like to say back to them is, well, if, please tell me the shape of your curve, okay? Because we know that we can solve the problem given a sufficient amount of data, but at, at, up front, we may not know what that amount is. And so it's a bit of an art to sort of judge this. And we work on three concepts, precedent. So if there's existing work, which has solved a similar problem, we see how much data was required for that. Intuition, if it's an easy concept uh, for a, a uh, a layman to learn, then perhaps we don't need so much data. And also we, we measure as we go. So as we acquire more data, we, we, we measure the rate at which this curve is improving. We know if we're, we're now saturating with data or if we can keep on going, get benefits with more data, okay? So this is it for me, and I hope that this was enjoyable. Uh, fundamentals of AI, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Toby. I feel fundamentally smarter, uh, more intelligent now that you gave this, this lecture. I'm curious to know how many of the um, surgeon or non-technical uh, uh, people that are uh, listening to us uh, have uh, now better understood what is artificial intelligence. Um, there is a, 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 a new saying that um, states that artificial intelligence is a little bit like adolescent sex. Everybody talks about it. Nobody really knows uh, uh, what is it. And uh, actually, nobody has done it yet. And I feel that in the surgical community, there is a lot of that. Everybody wants to talk about it. Uh, but I think that uh, it's not that easy to really come up with a uh, um, good way of explaining uh, what it is as you've done and uh, good uh, research uh, avenues as the one that you're conducting here right. at IRCAD. I don't know if we have any question in the the, uh, uh, in the audience, Rita, Maria, any question for Toby? Yes, Professor, we have some questions from the audience. We have a question from our colleague, Muhammad, that is asking how to make the data sets available, uh, how to, to improve the availability and the concerns about it, the, the patient uh, identification. Can we make it anonymous? What are your, your, your concerns about this? Yeah, okay. So, the, yeah, so they're the big questions. So, they're beyond the fundamentals. Uh, this is uh, acquisition of data, data collection is, is really uh, one of the core uh, challenges that has to be overcome, particularly in surgery, because unlike, for example, radiology, where uh, AI is really accelerating at a rapid pace, uh, the, the, the um, data is not systematically recorded usually. It's very um, heterogeneous so you can have video data but then you can also have you know audio signals from the OR this kind of stuff and there's no real standards to uh, to ensure that that's collected in a good way and it's not systematically collected in most hospitals anyway so the, just the logistic data logistics aspects is, is a big problem that has to be overcome um, when it comes to privacy well that's kind of a topic which is common to all of uh, med medicine and what I would say is that we can go quite far with anonymized data um, you know for example we with surgical videos, we can solve problems without necessarily needing to link it to the identity of the patient. Um, you know, for example, that anastomosis example, that's such an extremely difficult AI challenge, but perhaps we, 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 it could be solved without knowing who the patient is and linking it with preoperative data. Um, but that can only go so far. And so you have to then uh, really work uh, within the regulatory um, guidelines. And one very exciting area is uh, where we train these models to respect patient privacy. And uh, there's a lot of excitement about uh, differential privacy, which means we, we, we and, and federated learning as well, which means that we train these models locally in, in local hospital settings. So the data never leaves the hospital. And we can train in a way to promise that you can't reverse engineer the the results of the neural network to infer who was in the training data set. And that's probably one of the keys to uh, opening all this up. But to do that, you still need to actually have all the data logistics in place anyway. So it's a bit of a, uh, both problems need to be tackled at once. Maybe we have time for one very, very quick. Uh, Rita, we have time for one very quick question, uh, always related to Toby's lecture before we go to the next speaker. Okay, if we have, we will always need a human input to create a data, data sets. Hmm. 
or at some some moment we will be able to completely automatize. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, so at the moment we need we need the human intuition in there to 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 say what is the problem we want the computer to solve. Okay. So we have to set up what was the boundary of the problem to begin with. The, the day that the computer is able to sort of work out what problems it needs to solve and assemble the data it needs to solve to solve it, we're we're talking about sort of an, an extra layer level of reasoning, which is sort of beyond what we're doing today. Today we set the conditions and we train on that data. Uh, automation of, uh, of data acquisition is is a bit different, but but then by that by the same token, you know, uh, it's possible to to automatically generate data, you know. Um, uh, all the time when, um, for example, you know, when we, let's say, for example, in social media, when people are doing stuff uh, on social media, that's that's all, all data, which, uh, for example, Facebook has been used to train their systems. And that's just running in an engine all the time. So people are not sort of they, they set up a, a very broad network of ac acquisition of data. And then it's like a very, very, very autonomous process. And I think what, ultimately in surgery, it would be wonderful if, you know, there is this systematic data collection, systematic uh, insurance of privacy and stuff like this. And then we can think of sort of running stuff without so much uh, sort of supervision and guidelines from, from the computer scientists and other researchers. Thank you, Toby. So we're gonna to move to the next speaker. It is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dan Hashimoto. Hi, Dan, how are you? Uh, I'm Hello. so sorry you cannot be here with us in uh, in uh, in uh, in flesh, but uh, I hope very 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 soon. So Dan uh, is a surgeon scientist. He's the uh, co-founder and co-director of the uh, um, Surgical Artificial Intelligence and Innovation Lab at MJH. And uh, uh, Dan also works together with uh, the SAGES uh, AI Task Force. Uh, and uh, he's a surgeon endoscopist too. So I hope that your future work is gonna also focus more on uh, uh, flexible surgery, Dan. But the topic of today is AI in surgery, promises and perils. Um, the floor is yours, Dan. Thank you very much, Professor Pareda, and um, I really want to thank ERCAD and, and Professor Moresco and, uh, and Alemania and Professor Pareda for the opportunity. Um, hello to everybody around the globe. Um, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about some of the promises and probably more importantly, the perils um, of artificial intelligence and surgery and some of the insights that we've gained here um, through some of our work in Boston at, uh, at Mass General and Harvard. Um, a little bit of historical context. So in the early 1900s, so actually just about 100 years ago, we had a surgeon here at Mass General by the name of Ernest Amory Codman, who was one of the uh, original co-founders of the Quality Improvement Initiative with the American College of Surgeons. And he had proposed to create what he called the end result system of standardization. And quite simply, what that meant was actually logging the outcomes of the operations that his patients were undergoing to determine whether differences in his approach to both preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative management made an outcome, uh, made a difference in their outcome. And at the time, that idea was so radical <laughs> that he was fired from the Mass General for these, what were at the time considered crazy ideas of logging results, which is of course very uh, antithetical to the way that we practice surgery today. We want to know our results because we want to get better. We want to engage in quality improvement for the benefit of our patients and for the benefit of our own knowledge and learning. And we have advanced so much that now we have this field called surgical data science, which actually proposes to take all of the data coming from interventional healthcare and that's not just surgery, that includes interventional radiology, interventional gastroenterology, um, interventional pulmonology. And to take that data from across all phases of care, as Toby had mentioned, the diagnostic part, pre, intra, and post-op, and really try to understand from different data sources, and that can include video cameras, robotic kinematics, the electronic medical record, instruments, um, and to really understand how these are all coming together and playing a role in giving us a window and giving us insight into how our behavior in the operating room and how our, our choices that we make as clinicians will impact the outcome and the quality of life of our patients. And the real goal here is to continually improve the outcomes that we're getting so that our patients can be healthier and safer and have better recovery after the procedures that we perform. And really it's been about the evolution of surgery 
where in the historical past, I mean, even thinking back early, early on to some of the early surgeries that were done, for example, by some of the civilizations in Peru that were doing early trepanations, um, where at the time it was really about, well, it was about the surgeon and only the surgeon, no anesthesia, maybe some very rudimentary tools. And we've now moved into the present where we have some amounts of data that we can use to draw on our decision-making, but mainly we're, we're sort of a, a device-enabled surgeon. You know, we are a surgeon that can make decisions based off of very complex models that we can generate from things like electronic medical records, CT scans, um, some of the robots and ultrasounds that we can use to what we're moving into, which is a future of uh, data-enabled surgery, where we are augmented by the data that's available to us from a huge amount of resources. And that is now starting to include things like the genome, the proteome, the metabolome, uh, and thinking about how that influences our patients. And so when you think about the integrated data across the continuum of care, I like to break it down in a very similar manner to how Toby did, which is really thinking about the individual sort of breakdown of the episode of care into what is happening in the preoperative setting and how can we better understand the risk that our patients are facing and how can we incorporate data from all these different sources like their imaging, like the electronic medical record, and potentially use tools from artificial intelligence, like using computer vision, like using natural language processing, to make connections across these forms of data that will allow us to make better decisions, to inform the intra-op part of care, taking the video, taking the vital signs, taking the monitoring from the anesthesia monitor, so that we can better detect, and more importantly, predict post-operative complications and morbidity and mortality. And how does that individual patient contribute to the knowledge base that we get at the population level? Or how can we draw lessons from the population to affect or potentially uh, 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 impact our individual patient that's in front of us? Because as surgeons, we really have the privilege of taking care of patients one-on-one, -on -one, but we have to make those decisions based on data that we draw from a whole community of individuals. And some of the work that's been done has been really impressive. I think in artificial intelligence, people might immediately think about robotics. Oh, AI must involve a robot. And uh, Andrew Hung at, at University of Southern California has done some really incredible work on looking at automated performance metrics in surgery that are drawn from some of the kinematic data that is the motion data that comes from robotic surgery. And so he was able to train machine learning algorithms to really break down an operation to its component parts and understand and better understand how each of those metrics from those parts can contribute to a prediction of whether an individual is going to have a potential longer length of stay, whether it might affect some patient reported outcome measures, particularly in neurology like continence or sexual function. But we're not limited to just using robotic data to try to get insights into our operations. Um, as Professor Pareto mentioned, I have a particular interest in surgical endoscopy. And so one of our fellows, Thomas Ward, has done some really incredible work taking our data that we have uh, gathered from per oral endoscopic myotomy. So doing endoscopic cases and really trying to understand, can we automatically identify parts of the operation that are deviating from an expected operative course? And how do they tie into the outcome that they're going to have? And what we call this sort of figure here is the surgical fingerprint. This gives us an idea of what are some of the differences in an operation that occur and, and how a surgeon has proceeded through the steps of the operation and what are the differences in the anatomy and in the inflammation and in the events that are occurring in the OR. And we try to tie in elements of the preoperative risk stratification. So understanding their preoperative morbidity, understanding their imaging, to try to identify areas where the path that a surgeon should take through an operation is going to deviate from the standard lap coli, for example, or poem. And some of those things that we can draw on are things like automatically detecting what's called the Parkland grading score. So it's a scale of how bad cholecystitis you might have. And some of the work that Thomas has done has demonstrated that in automatically scoring the Parkland grading scale, we were able to draw out some insights from the video at the beginning of a case and to then subsequently look at how the case went. So what we found was that for each point increase in the Parkland score, 
you see, not surprisingly, an increase in the operative time as surgeons may be engaging in more dissection. What we also see is that you have an increased odds of injuring the gallbladder when you have greater inflammation. Again, that's not terribly surprising, but it's nice to be able to quantify that and understand when your risk of potentially spilling infected bile is going to go up. Interestingly, there is no impact in the surgeon's likelihood of attaining the critical view of safety. And so even though you might have significant inflammation, uh, you're still just as likely, perhaps by taking more time, to achieve the critical view of safety. But this really raises the question as to whether some of these potential for injury could raise the possibility that you're gonna have an increased risk of infected biloma and other surgical site infections. What's also interesting is that we can rely on some of the annotations that we draw from experts. So this is some collaborative work that we've done with the University of Toronto, the University of California, San Francisco, Imperial College London, um, where we were able to engage experts uh, from hepatobiliary surgery and minimally invasive surgery and general surgery uh, to actually take different images of laparoscopic cholecystectomy and to try to identify where are the safe and unsafe zones of dissection. So the go zone or the no go zone in surgery. And what we were ultimately able to do was to actually train a neural network to automatically identify where is it most likely to be safe to start a dissection when you're doing your lap coli here in the green, and where is it likely to be a danger zone? Where could you possibly injure something like the common bile duct or the duodenum, as you can see here in red? And you can use that as an overlay to help provide feedback and education to trainees or junior surgeons who may have a harder time understanding where to start their dissection. Now, this gallbladder is very straightforward, but what we have found in subsequently analyzing cases where the common bile duct has been accidentally transected is that this model also performs well in the more complex anatomic cases where we see the surgeon in hindsight has been operating in the red zone or the no-go zone and potentially could have avoided creating that common bile duct injury if they had had the assistance of this type of artificial intelligence technology that isn't prescriptive. It won't make them operate in a certain area, but it allows them to draw on the experience of other surgeons to make a more informed decision about how they want to proceed with their operation. Now, this has a lot of implications, obviously, this type of work. Um, Firstly, just identifying which step of the operation you're in, even if you forget about the real-time decision support, it allows you to automatically index and bookmark your operative steps. So if you are a trainee or you're an educator, you can then don't have to go through two, three hours of video in a case. You can just say, hey, I want to look at these particular sections of the operation. Can you pull those for me automatically? This insists in case preparation, in coaching, which is a huge topic of discussion right now, um, and also in feedback. And this really also lays the foundation for event-specific detection. So to Toby's example, if you look at an anastomosis or you look at a staple line, can you potentially predict when you're going to have a high risk of bleeding or when you're going to have a higher risk of a leak? And then can you provide that information to the surgeon right there in the operating room so they can make some real-time decisions about whether they need to uh, either reinforce that staple line or otherwise make some other decisions to potentially redo an anastomosis or make a different operative step? I think there's a lot of obstacles and limitations, and here's where the perils come into play. We've already heard a question about access to data. We have a very limited quantity of data. It's very hard to share that data because this is health data and it has a lot of regulations around it and they change from country to country. Or in the US, it changes from state to state actually. We also have limited annotation. So it is very important in things like operative video to have very high quality annotations so that you know and the machine knows that the information it's receiving is actually reflecting the clinical reality of the situation. There are also systematic biases that are in our data that we don't necessarily imbue, but may be influencing the way a machine is trained. So how is it that if I only use the data from, for example, Mass General, that may reflect only a specific patient population here in New England. It may not apply to surgeons that are in France or surgeons that are in Peru, Japan, China. And so to help with that, we have actually put together a consensus conference. You'll see Professor Peretta here, Professor Padois, uh, Dr. Mascagni, who's also in this webinar. Um, they brought together participants from all over the world to collaborate and really try to come up 
with key definitions and guidelines, recommendations for how to engage in this type of research, how to ensure that the ground truth is accurately annotated, and how to set the stage for the sharing of data so that we can get a more generalizable data set on which these algorithms can train. And I think this is gonna be a big part of the field moving forward where surgeons have a big role to play because surgeons in particular have to weigh in on what are the clinical relevances of these types of data. And I think that takes me to the point that how can a clinician help contribute to the advancement in this field? I don't think you necessarily need to be a programmer. You don't need to be a computer scientist because as a surgeon, you can help collect data. You can work with these data scientists and engineers to annotate the data, which relies very heavily on your clinical experience. Um, and really, the main thing is you can engage in critical appraisal of the literature and any products. There's obviously a, lo a lot of hype surrounding this. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, potentially unfounded promises coming out. And it's really understanding what this technology can and cannot do given the limitations that we have. And you as a clinician are really armed to help make some of these appraisals. And so I just sort of want to close that by saying that the near future of AI enabled surgery, I don't particularly see as being automation just yet but I really see it as being the augmentation of clinical care where the machine is able to enhance our abilities as human surgeons to really move this field forward. And so with that, I'll stop there and, and thank you again very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Dan. Brilliant lecture as usual. Um, <clears throat> probably there are some questions and I, I'm looking at uh, Maria and Rita in the uh, moderation room. And Rita, you have some questions from the audience? Yes, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. We have a question regarding uh, how can humans uh, justify the decisions, the surgical decisions made by artificial intelligence? And what are the consequences, legally speaking, of these decisions? Uh, also, maybe does the insurance cover or not cover this type of, uh, of procedures? These are very brilliant and complex questions that are being worked on right now. Uh, as it stands right now, there is no insurance reimbursement. There's actually no FDA approval for an intraoperative decision support system, at least in the U.S. There are, of course, AI algorithms that have been FDA approved to help with diagnostics, uh, particularly in radiology and cardiology. Um, they are of limited scope. I think this question about who has the liability is a very interesting one. Um, and I think that's going to be figured out through a combination of uh, engagement with surgeons, uh, data scientists, engineers, uh, lawyers, obviously politicians, of course, have a played a role in the regulation of this, um, and ethicists. The question here is how much of the decision is taken out of the surgeon's hands and made by the machine alone? And how much is it that the machine is providing you with additional data that you as the clinician can then make a reasonable estimate about what you want to do next? Just like any other data that we receive, I think at least for the short term, which I sort of think about as the next five to 10 years, anything that we get from AI will still leave a lot of discretion to the surgeon. And I think ultimately um, the surgeon will be responsible. And then it'll of course be put to the test at some point uh, in a medical legal manner. But this is complex and I think still needs to be worked out. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. Yeah, indeed, it's a very complex and uh, <clears throat> probably we have to be prepared for the next stage in uh, AI and surgery. Uh, and there will be very interesting later to look at the opinion of, of uh, Denise McWilliams, uh, another perspective. So uh, we will look, we will look at, uh, at the, the next lecture. So Dan, you stay with us because we don't know what sort of question will come uh, progressively and uh, we're moving to uh, Andrew Gums. Uh, Andrew Gums uh, is a former head of minimally invasive surgery, hepatobiliary uh, surgery in uh, MD Anderson. And then uh, I don't know for, for which reason he moved to France and now he's uh, in charge of the HPV program in the Centre Hospitalier uh, Intercommunal de Poissy. Uh, it's uh, near Paris in France. Uh, probably for the wine, uh, <laughs> but uh, also uh, very recently, uh, he accepted uh, the position of uh, editor-in-chief of a journal on uh, artificial intelligence surgery. So it fits very well with our program. So Andrew, we ask you to address the lecture looking at uh, real life examples of uh, AI surgery today. So thank you for being with us. Uh, hello, let me get my presentation. Uh, please let me know when you can see it. 
Is it up there? Yeah, perfect. Okay, great. Uh, it, it's funny, I, I just had a, a deja vu moment. Um, reminded me about, God, I think it must have been about 12 or 13 years ago when I presented laparoscopic Whipple procedure at uh, Sages in Philadelphia. And um, I was kind of told what a crazy idea that was. And, um, it, you know, interestingly, it, it turns out that I don't think laparoscopic Whipple procedures were, were such a crazy idea. Um, regarding real life examples of artificial intelligence and surgery, um, as mentioned, um, I'm the editor in chief of a new artificial intelligence uh, journal called uh, Artificial Intelligence Surgery. And the first editorial that I did uh, really talks about my concept of artificial intelligence surgery. We made a conscious decision not to call the journal Artificial Intelligence in Surgery, but to call it Artificial Intelligence Surgery because surgery is different from medicine. Surgery involves movement and procedures and it is an active field. Medicine really involves, um, as we all know, things that don't involve physical activity. So it's very important um, in the concept of what artificial intelligence surgery is to talk about automatic autonomous actions. So this is just what the journal looks like. It was launched in February of this year. It'll be quarterly. Uh, first issue scheduled for September. Uh, this is what the website looks like. Uh, the first editorial is already up. Uh, what is artificial intelligence surgery? Uh, this just shows a Gartner hype cycle. Uh, you know, I agree uh, with uh, uh, Professor Hashimoto that you know, there is a disconnect between what people think of artificial in intelligence surgery and what the reality is today. I think everyone has seen Star Trek and they think artificial intelligence surgery and involves we do. the machine doing everything practical. automatically. And uh, that's, that's not the case. There's gonna be a lot of work between where we are now and to getting autonomous actions. That said, we do have certain autonomous actions, which I do wanna talk about. So you can see the curve here I think we had a peak of, infl of uh, inflation of expectations where everyone thought, you know, the machine would save us. And you can see there's a pretty steep uh, dive uh, down to the trough of disillusionment. But I would actually argue that we are on the upswing. And hopefully uh, some of the videos I show uh, will kind of explain why. So again, the current robotic system is really just telemanipulation. That is not in uh, neither of our books, artificial intelligence. It is a stepping stone. It'll get us to artificial intelligence surgery, but you know, it's very important that we realize that robotic surgery is just telemanipulation and there's really no autonomous actions on the surface going on. But the good news is I actually believe we, we are all already artificial intelligence surgeons. Now, why do I say that? Uh, Valley Lab, everyone uses coagulation. So there's tissue sensing technology in the monopolar and the bipolar, and there's a closed loop control with 434,000 data points per second being analyzed by the, by the machine for us, measuring things like resistance and capacitance, taking into account the, the size of the vessel um, to help us seal it. You know, this is, a, this is an intelligent device that is enabling us, enabling us to do safer and better surgery. What about the ligature? There's advanced vessel sealing algorithm. Let me see if I can move that. I don't know if I can. But anyway, again, the ligature takes into account the size of the vessel and it adapts depending on the size. It takes a little bit longer or, or less time to cut it. This is giving us better outcomes, uh, decreasing blood loss, decreasing uh, postoperative hemorrhage. This is an artificial intelligence surgical device that is enabling us to do better surgery. So the cyber knife, granted it's not surgery as far as uh, general surgery is concerned, but it has a pretty impressive um, impact obviously for neurosurgery. It's been around since 1994. So I actually started my kind of um, research career in radiation therapy um, and I actually worked quite a bit at Yale University uh, on, on radi with the radiation therapists. You can see they have a cyber knife, which has a, a computer that, that is attached to sensors on a vest, will actually enable the robot to deliver radiation treatments 
in accordance with movements of the of the patient's uh, lung and chest. So you'll get to see that in a second. So classically, treatments of um, for radiation therapy usually are five treatments a week for five weeks or longer or shorter, and they're very long treatments. With the CyberKnife, it moves with the patient, it's constantly changing, it has a multi-leaf collimator, and it can give precisely the treatment that it wants, where it wants, safer and quicker. And this has been around for over 25 years. A robot that is, it is, um, it has settings put in by a human, obviously, but the, you know, the, the robot then is moving by itself. It's not being telemanipulated, if you will. It has set devices that is reacting to the patient's movement autonomously. And it is, it is doing an amazing, amazing work. Really, um, you know, th this is really a window into our future. And I think nearer future than, than we think. So what about this device? This is, um, this was known as the iDrive back when, uh, when I started using it. So this is an automatic stapler device. I think we can all agree it's really more of a, te a tele-manipulation robot in the sense that you can control it with your fingers. But there's one aspect to it which, again, in my mind, is, and it is an example of artificial intelligence. It has a sensor on the end. If the tissue is too thick, it'll change the speed of the stapling or it'll, it'll altogether, it'll stop the stapling. Uh, I'm probably not the only one who back in the old days would force a stapler to work when I shouldn't have and I regretted it. The beauty with this device is it prevents you from doing that. Um, it, it, it'll slow down the stapler. It'll potentially give you less, less leaks, less uh, delayed staple line leaks or what have you. This is a smart device. This is the device that I've been using for, I'm afraid to say, but probably at least eight years. It's been around. Um, again, this is another example of an autonomous action. It's handheld. You know, it's not the entire robotic system, but it's another example of artificial intelligence surgery that really should not be ignored. Let me see if I can get this out of the way. Sorry about all this uh, static here. Okay. So, of course, now I can't. All right, we'll leave that there. All right. Next, next example. Now, the Da Vinci surgical system. Now, I don't think it's an example of artificial intelligence, but you know, for the reasons I mentioned, it's a, a telemanipulator. It's a robotic device. It'll get us one day to totally an autonomous surgery. But there's one aspect of the Da Vinci that is autonomous. And it'll, it'll save time in the operating room. It'll make the operation easier for the robotic surgeon. It's when you move the patient. When you move the patient, the four robotic arms will move automatically with you. This is, saves time. It enables the surgeon to be able to move the robot more frequently during the operation, potentially having better outcomes, quicker operations. This is not a small thing. This is a beautiful thing. And it, again, it should be celebrated. It should be studied and it should be discussed and kind of not just uh, swept under the rug. So integrated table motion. So another little tidbit that people often forget is that the robot, even the Da Vinci was, was originally designed for open surgery. So this is a robot called Penelope that is actually a robotic surgical assistant that was developed uh, Columbia Presbyterian. Uh, I believe it was first used when I was a fellow or a young attending there. And again, it's a surgical assistant. Uh, I couldn't find video of it actually being used, but it has been used in humans. Um, it'll just get uh, instruments that the surgeon needs and it'll give it to the surgeon. It'll take the, the instrument back. It, you know, economically, I'm not sure if it was uh, exactly a winner, but nonetheless, it shows us that artificial intelligence is not only in minimally invasive surgery. It can also be in open surgery. And, the, and again, this is just an example of open surgery and artificial intelligence, and I think uh, another example of uh, where we're headed. So this is another smaller robot used mainly for the interventional radiologists, all right? It's the automated alignment is slated for this summer, so I wasn't able to show you a video. Nonetheless, I wanna show you kind of what we have so far. So this is a device currently used for 
angio CT or in really mainly the intervention radiologist, but it can also be used for, uh, for ablations of the liver. It is a little robot currently, and you'll see in this video, it's being telemanipulated um, by the intervention radiologist and it's, it enables us to do ablations safer, quicker. I don't know if anyone out there has done a laparoscopic ablation of a, of a small lesion deep in the liver. It can be torture, it can be time consuming. And as of this summer, this device will enable us to have automatic alignment. Now the surgeon or the intervention radiologist will need to put the needle in, but the alignment will be there. And that'll be such a time saver and such a beautiful thing. It'll enable us to do more lesions, uh, probably have decreased rates of recurrence. And this is another thing on the horizon as of you know just in a couple of months that I think is gonna be really a game changer. So I'm not sure if I have the time, but I was just gonna show a little bit of this device being used in an endo leak. Let me skip a little bit in the interest of time. Oops, I skipped too much. Let's see here. Yes, okay, so you have a C-arm in the operating room. Um, you, you will be able to get your, your alignment and your access based on uh, the computer analysis. And, and once you get the alignment, you'll be able to see here a treatment being done. You have your line. You can see where the needle has to go. Again, the surgeon or the interventional radiologist will have to hold the needle. But as anyone knows, pushing the needle in is not the hard part. The hard part is getting the alignment. And there's a robot now that can help you do that better. You do it one step at a time, you push the needle in slowly, you take another image. And this just shows getting exactly at, uh, I believe a type two endo leak um, for an intra aortic stent. And it, they're able to do a specific, uh, precise treatment quickly and effectively with the assistant of a robot. And this will be automated as of this summer. This is the last example I have time for. Uh, this is something you can get on your iPhone now it's uh, called Jarvis, which for any uh, Marvel comic fans stands for just another rather very intelligent system it was coined by Tony Stark in Marvel comics, otherwise known as Iron Man. Um, also the name of his butler and incidentally Jarvis ultimately became Vision. So here's the site where you can download Jarvis. And let me just show you a quick video that you can see of how Jarvis works. Now you can use this now and with your phone. Maybe you're, you're doing your cholecystectomy, you're not sure of your critical view, maybe you're new, you just hold up your phone and it'll tell you whether you've obtained the critical view or not. Um, you know, I could see one day that this being part of the operative note that you know, maybe you take a little picture with your Jarvis, you see, your, you see that you uh, met all the criteria and you go ahead and do your, um, your cholecystectomy. All the values have to be in the 80 to 90% range. They'll turn green on, the, on your screen. And voila, we have artificial intelligence on our iPhones already for surgery. So I don't have time for this one. So I'm gonna skip that. This is just augmented reality for a liver surgery, but that's not available. But I just wanted to close with, this is the Gartner hype cycle that I've developed um, more recently. You know, and I think the important step and the important idea is that artificial intelligence surgery is gonna be a long process. It's gonna involve handheld robotics. It's gonna involve small little baby steps of automation. But, uh, but I, I encourage all of you to join the journey because I think it's gonna be very exciting to one day get to fully autonomous surgery. Is that gonna happen in our lifetimes? Maybe, probably not, but you know, uh, I certainly, I've done a lot of easy appendectomies that I can imagine a robot doing a lot easier than what that cyber knife was doing. So again, uh, I don't know if you can see that, you probably can't, but these are just examples of automatic actions in surgery, in interventional radiology, in radiation therapy today that people are using uh, now. And I really wanna thank uh, Professor Peretta Moresco and Daleman for this wonderful uh, opportunity to talk. 
And I also want to congratulate Daniel Hashimoto, uh, I believe, on his book, Digital Surgery, which I, I have ordered and I am waiting for it to arrive. Um, but I, I really enjoyed his talk. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. So I understand that you didn't receive the book of uh, Dan. Not you. yet. Not, Not yet. yet. Uh, I, so he didn't send it to you. I can't afford it. I'm on a French salary now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I had to wait. So Dan. As soon as it's out, I'll send it, I'll send it to Andrew and I'll send it to, to, to Ericad too. I think it's coming out in July, artificial intelligence and surgery. Oh my goodness. So, thank you, Andrew. Uh, so it, it, I think you're right. This is a, a point of view of uh, artificial intelligence because indeed we are using some intelligent machines and for all surgeons like me and Jack, who's still in the room, uh, we, we've been used to do a, a anastomosis by a suture and then we uh, learned how the stapler was working. So uh, today we have this intelligent stapler. So this is a big progression in surgery. And uh, for the young generation who's just using that today, they don't realize the progress done in the past 30 years. So this is very important. And I will turn back to uh, Rita and Maria uh, because they are collecting a lot of questions. So. Uh, Rita, one question, the best one. Professor, I think uh, due to time constraints, if you like, I can summarize the questions uh, after because they are very similar. Okay, so uh, Andrew, you wait. <laughs> okay, so now I I'm turning to uh, Pietro, Pietro Mascani. Uh, Pietro Mascani is uh, one of our, our fellow uh, and he is the one who's working very strongly uh, in uh, artificial intelligence. And uh, uh, we have the chance of having him. He's coming from Roma, uh, from uh, La Catolica and, uh, come on? Um, Fondazione 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 Polichinico Polichinico Gemelli. Gemelli de Rome. So it's a very prestigious institution in, uh, in uh, Roma. And so he joined us for his fellowship and his PhD and he's working on, on artificial intelligence. So um, I'm asking to Pietro to uh, introduce his mentor in artificial intelligence. So Pietro, do it and introduce uh, Nicolas Padua. Thank you very much. So it's, I'm super excited to be among my mentors and my role models in surgical data science, I would say. I'll have the honor to present Nicolas Padua, professor of computer science at the University of Strasbourg, director of the Kama Lab and director of AI research at the ASHU Strasbourg. And I was lucky enough to have him as a computer scientist with the surgeons tutoring me these last three years. So please, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, uh, Pietro, for, for the kind of uh, introduction and also for the uh, uh, opportunity. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, it's really a, a pleasure to be here. Uh, I uh, really hope you are enjoying this uh, webinar as much as I do. So today, what I would like to share with you with some insights on how we look at the question of developing AI and solution at uh, ISU Strasbourg that can impact uh, patients and clinicians. So as you know, many AI success stories have uh, hit the news and also big scientific journals in the domain of uh, medical image analysis in the last few years. Um, AI has proved to be better than experienced uh, radiologists or pathologists in uh, detecting common tumor types, for example. Still, we are yet to see the same success stories on how AI is improving surgical outcomes or surgical workflows with a strong impact on uh, surgical care. And one reason is that surgery is a very complex. There is a lot of variability across operating rooms, across uh, devices, patients, and procedures and workflow. And um, the OR is also equipped with so many equipment that it is very difficult to access to all the multimodal data. And furthermore, since we are talking about treatment and the workflow is very complex as it contains multiple interaction between the persons in the room, the persons and the uh, devices. So our vision in Strasbourg is to develop uh, an AI system that, that can tackle the challenges inherent to surgery and we envision this system uh, to be like a surgical control tower akin uh, to the aeronautical control tower that you all know. And this tower will capture, uh, collect, analyze all the data from the operating room to understand and break down the complex uh, surgical uh, processes into individual tasks that can all be monitored. 
so clearly, this is a goal that is not going to be achieved tomorrow, uh, given the complexity of the task. Um, but we are starting to make inroads uh, uh, in this field. So you can see, for example, here how such a, a tower could monitor the progress of the surgery, for instance, to improve coordination or um, scheduling. It could be used also to uh, implement uh, safety ch uh, checks could be used to intervene, like to present the next uh, needed tool in the surgery, or it could be used to optimize the workflow or for instance here, the radiation received by the surgical staff or by the patients in X-ray based uh, surgery. So as I said, you know, we are start starting to make progress uh, towards uh, AI in, in surgery. And I think a way to begin um, to tackle this challenge is to focus on targeted clinical applications. And uh, what I would like to do now is to share with you a story where we have been applying AI for a surgery that is, uh, I believe, very familiar with all of you, laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So it is a very common and standardized procedure, um, one of the most performed abdominal surgery with over 1 million lap cholé per year uh, just in the US. Still, there is uh, an important uh, uh, injury that can be caused, the bilog injuries uh, that can have dramatic consequences for, for patients. The rate of BDI is quite small, uh, 0.3 to 1.5%, but considering the amount of procedures performed, this uh, uh, can, can have dramatic consequences. And so what is more concerning is that the rate of BDI today is uh, three times higher than the rate of the BDI when the surgery were open, so 30 years ago. Um, so many uh, you know, societies have recommended um, safety maneuver to uh, address uh, this uh, issue, which is called the critical view of safety, that can prevent uh, most of the major BDI. However, it's not always performed, for, um, for instance, because of uh, an overconfidence uh, from uh, some surgeons. So what can we do about this? So one way to address the, the, the problem is, uh, is manual. We could go into the surgical department, which we have done with uh, Pietro, to suggest a five second timeout um, before the clipping uh, or cutting of the cystic duct or artery to verify that all the CDS criteria have been achieved. And so with Fiatro, we went to the surgical department to propose uh, this rule. And if you look at this graph that shows the evolution of the performance of the CDS over time, we see that, uh, you know, we started at about 25% and it jumped after the, the intervention to about 70% to then decrease to a roughly 45%. So it's already a good improvement, but can we do better with AI? And so we clearly we have two clinical uh, needs here that we need to, to address. One is uh, CVS is strongly recommended, but not performed sufficiently. And the self-reporting of CVS, by clinician is also not accurate. So what can AI do? And I believe that we can you know, develop automated systems that analyze uh, surgical videos to evaluate those criteria, as has been briefly shown by Andrew earlier. So what uh, we do here, and uh, what we see here, especially it's a very nice piece of work by Pietro, Armin, and Deepak in collaboration with some senior clinicians from IRCAD and IHU, where we have a live system that can evaluate automatically the three criteria of the critical view of safety, you will see that when the cystic plate is di dissected, this criteria come from a red cross uh, to a check. So this is the type of system that could be um, used to implement automated uh, safety check in uh, the operating room. Then what about self, uh, about reporting? So uh, what you see here is uh, also a, a nice work by the same team where we are using tools from artificial intelligence to detect the surgical tools in the view, the surgical activities that are performed to automatically locate in the video where the cystic duct division takes place. Once you have this time step, you can cut out a part of the video, a video clip and add it in the surgical report to have a, a video augmented uh, report that is more objective. So to develop this kind of, of technologies, you know, we use a traditional uh, concepts uh, of artificial intelligence where we define a clear clinical problem, collect uh, data, define a clear annotation protocol, annotate uh, the data with a small team, and then train machine learning algorithms to learn from this data how to perform the segmentation of the anatomy to predict the criteria of the critical view of safety. And then we can evaluate 
the machine learning model on a large set of surgical videos. So you can see here some of the qualitative results on challenging cases where you see the red cross and the green check that shows the, how the criteria are assessed. So this is well and good, but what we need to do now is to show that those type of technology really scale up and can generalize outside our own institution. Um, but I won't touch uh, about this topic today. I just would like to continue by saying that this kind of uh, technologies, I think to be successful, we need to really have full-time multidisciplinary teams that work together on a specific and a focused uh, clinical topic. And so that's what we do uh, in our team, and especially for this project where we are very fortunate uh, to have Pietro, as we said, is a medical doctor from, uh, from Italy, but who decided to do a PhD thesis in surgical data science before doing his surgical residency. And I think this is really great for the team because to uh, develop effective solutions, we really need uh, an, uh, a continuous joint education between the computer scientists and the clinicians to learn a common language and understanding. The computer scientist needs to understand what the operating room is, what are the constraints of the surgical workflow, and vice versa, the clinician needs to learn about, about the potential of artificial intelligence and also the limitations so that we can together develop or suggest some relevant uh, problems and meaningful solutions. So I really think that you know this, this team like Pietro Deepak, I mean, are now very well equipped to do a key contribution in artificial intelligence uh, for surgery in the future after such uh, training. But generally, you know, the communication between both communities, engineering, computer science, and, and uh, clinicians, is uh, is uh, challenging. Um, and um, I would like to illustrate this with, uh, with one interesting paper that came out uh, this summer. So this is a, a paper from Annals of Surgery published in 2020, which has for objective to uh, do a review of the machine learning techniques for surgical phase recognition. So recognizing parts of the surgery, this is uh, a technique we have used uh, in the video before to cut out a clip to document the critical view of safety. If you look in details, you see that the first paper that they cite is from 2006. And it turns out that Ahmad Armadi, the first author, is one of my former colleagues. And he did, in fact, submit to surgical endoscopy in 2006 uh, to um, you know, translate his work. But unfortunately, the paper was rejected. So I really believe that it means that there is a gap in the term of uh, language between both communities that we need to try and, uh, and bridge uh, together. So, and to bridge uh, the, the, the communities together, it is our role, both from the computer science community and from the clinical community to create joint events, uh, like uh, the SAGES consensus on uh, surgical video annotation that has been organized by our friends and, and colleagues from uh, Boston, and Dan Hashimoto and, and, and uh, Oz uh, Mereles. But we also need to have clinical days in engineering conferences, as well as engineering days in clinical conferences, to have tutorial from clinicians for engineers or from engineers for clinicians, uh, like for instance, the textbook uh, of Dan that, we, that has been mentioned earlier. And especially, I believe one of the you know, big efforts that we all need to make is uh, to propose grand challenges um, with a real uh, clinical uh, target. And I believe that uh, all of you here in the audience have a big role to play in this. Um, so I would like to, to conclude by uh, thanking, uh, you know, all the, the people who have contributed to this work and that continue to, uh, to contribute to, uh, uh, to it, as well as our clinical uh, partners. And perhaps I would like to, to end with a shameless uh, advertisement. Uh, if you want uh, or are interested into this kind of scientific tandems you know, between clinicians and researchers, if you would like to do a one-year clinical fellowship with engineers um, or even a PhD in surgical data science like Pietro did, please uh, feel free uh, to contact us. Thank you. Uh, Nicola, that was a fantastic uh, lecture. For the sake of time, and since a lot of topics were slightly uh, similar, we're going to take the question at the end. And uh, um, I'm going to ask Dennis McWilliams to talk just before Pietro, because uh, we keep the cherry on the cake, the sweetest for the last. So Dennis uh, is a, an old time friend. Uh, we have known each other forever, and uh, Dennis is a uh, serial life science uh, entrepreneur. He now uh, works as a partner at Sante Venture, 
And uh, he picked himself the title of his presentation, which is interesting because I'm the one known to pick very exotic titles. So Dennis is going to talk about uh, Uniker hunting why invest in medical AI. Dennis, the floor is yours. Thank we you, Savannah. And uh, yeah, how about now? Yeah, thanks, Savannah. And uh, thank you, Urkad and uh, Bernard and, and uh, Nicholas. This is a great, uh, great webinar and uh, re really appreciate you allowing me to give some thoughts. It's uh, um, certainly kind of hate being the uh, the commercial investor uh, here, here, because a lot of times we are the considered the wet blanket um, on new innovative technology. But I must say that um, so this is a space I find personally very interesting in the space that I, you know, I think I should uh, move forward and Hopefully I can provide some context and some frameworks in terms of how the investment uh, community is uh, looking at these types of applications. So I did pick my uh, title. Um, as everyone knows, unicorns uh, is a term um, you know, used in uh, venture capital to, to describe startup companies that are worth um, over a billion dollars. So we talk about you know, how we think about that. Um, I think it's nice to always think about really where we are. I mean, this is uh, Colossus, um, which was uh, really the first uh, digital computer. Um, and um, I love this quote from Stephen Hawking. He's not the only person to be an, an alarmist on the, uh, the powers and perils of intellectual, um, of, uh, intellectual and artificial intelligence. Um, and, and, you know, I think it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's interesting to, to think about where we're going to be going um, and as these uh, themes evolve. So, so one thing I think is fascinating, and, and the timing of this talk is really interesting. I, you know, I, I was shocked when I went back and looked at the data in terms of the amount of investment going into uh, companies that classify themselves as healthcare AI. Um, almost $27 billion in 2020 um, was invested in almost 500 different companies. Um, that's an astonishing amount. Um, even if you look at a fairly robust investment cycle over the past 10 years, um, in 2021, we're actually on track to shatter that record as well. Um, we've done $12 billion in investment um, up until now. Um, and so, you know, certainly if we go back to you know, Adam's comment earlier, the hype cycle, um, certainly from an investor standpoint, is, is at its peak and uh, will continue to go. And, um, you know, hopefully here we can try to align some of that um, with the, uh, the zone of enlightenment that we hope we all are entering at this point. So there really are some unicorns um, in this space, um, but I would I would say that the the term actually really applies here. They are they're fairly rare. Um, there are 14 companies that describe themselves as healthcare AI companies. Um, this is across all of healthcare, um, not not just limited to surgery. Um, and of those 14, only two actually are doing artificial intelligence as their core business. So um, iCarbonX and Recursion, um, you know, are, are two that if I go through this list, I would say that their core thesis and core value proposition is artificial intelligence. Um, the rest of them are, you know, typically building off of a more broad uh, business model, business pattern. Um, you know, you look at a Livongo, you look at a, a Flatiron. These are existing businesses that leverage AI across large data. Um, but, you know, it, I think it's hard to classify them as core um, artificial intelligence based companies. So th they really are hard to find. Um, and, you know, if you think about where the applications in artificial intelligence and healthcare are, uh, this is a survey done by Optum, the, the large U.S. Uh, healthcare fund on artificial intelligence and healthcare. And they, they interview executives at hospitals and life science companies. Um, and you can see, you know, these are the priorities where they see artificial intelligence, um, you know, helping their businesses from a business standpoint. Really only one, you know, you could, you could really qualify as patient directed. Most of the applications people are looking at are optimization, uh, fraud detection, um, you know, looking at reimbursement coding and improving that. And to be frank, these are really just simply applications of, um, kind of you know, broader artificial intelligence applications in, in big data, non-specific to healthcare that happen to be happening in healthcare. So, you know, I think we're still at a stage where we're not seeing the unicorns and the focus on really patient-directed artificial intelligence, which I think, you know, most of the people on this webinar um, are probably going to be most focused on. Um, so why is that? Um, you know, I think a really good example can be found in uh, digital mammography and radiology. Actually, in the, in the 1990s, my very first project was um, helping out with a program called the Missiles to Mammograms. 
Um, this was a, um, a, a push by the Central Intelligence Agency of the US to take technology that was being used to identify uh, missile silos in Russia from satellite images and detect breast cancer lesions. Um, and a tremendous amount of capital was invested at that point. And you know, the, the promise of artificial intelligence and radiology has been there for quite some time. Um, you know, turned out in the early 90s, the technology just wasn't there from a, uh, really from a hardware perspective, um, let alone from a software perspective. But uh, Jeff Hinton um, in 2016, you know, instilled incredible controversy in the space that basically said, we should stop training radiologists now. Um, it's completely obvious within five years, deep learning is going to do better than radiologists. Turns out um, he was wrong. It only took three years. Um, and in 2019, a commercial um, AI system actually beat uh, breast cancer screening by 101 radiologists. Turns out the algorithms weren't quite as good as the very best radiologists, but in terms of the majority of uh, radiologists, turns out the digital, artificial, and deep, deep learning systems um, were better. Um, and so you would say that, wow, that's you know, similar to the breakthroughs that we saw when you know, the computers beat Go or when, um, when IBM Watson beat Jeopardy, and that that would lead to a revolution in healthcare AI for patients. But it really hasn't. Um, there's been tremendous headwinds um, in this space. And you know, many of these have been highlighted by the speakers before, but you know, you've had tremendous physician resistance to this. You know, physicians who are concerned that they're gonna lose their job because of this data ownership, liability, you know, all these are headwinds within the space. Despite that, it's estimated that 92% of all mammography facilities use computer-aided diagnostics. So there's a big disconnect here. Um, so on one hand, um, the technology is fairly pervasive that's out there. But on the other hand, there really aren't good business models um, out there for these types of technologies. Um, there was a question earlier to Dan Hashimoto about reimbursement in the space. Um, this is um, yeah, the actual, the, the, the CMS coding for computer-aided diagnostics and breast mammography. Um, there is actually no incremental dollars that a hospital gets um, if they use a computer-aided system versus doing it just with the radiologist alone. So the question is, is if you're a company developing these systems, how are you going to get paid? I mean, is the radiologist going to take money out of their pocket? to pay you for that, that uh, decision support? Is the hospital gonna pay incremental um, on that? Typically not. And so this is a big problem that we're facing. Um, turns out Europe has done a better job at this than the United States. Um, you know, they've been a bit more aggressive in, in paying for computer-aided diagnostics, but more along the lines of, of efficiency and operational efficiency as opposed to patient care. So what about the patient? Um, you know, most of us here are focused on you know, innovations in surgery and how we can apply these technologies here. So what are some of the lessons we can learn from this? Um, I'm gonna show you a framework that, that we've used at Sante to kind of think about um, and summarize the complexities of what we've seen from uh, the, the previous speakers and really kind of think about the data we have available to us in surgery in terms of its, its complexity um, and in terms of its, the complexity in data collection and analysis. So on the bottom left, we have EHR data. So this is static data. This is the data, you know, talking about the demographics and basic treatments associated with patients. You can evaluate this at, at your leisure, develop insights that would maybe drive future patients. Pre-op imaging fits into this category. There's no real rush necessarily to be able to do it. You don't need a real-time processing. But as you get into some of these applications um, you know, that we've shown today, um, as exciting as they are, um, it's exponential the cost to acquire and store this data. So who's going to bear that cost? Um, you know, it's hard to convince hospital systems today uh, to make significant investments just in their EHR data. And only now are you starting to see more robust um, uh, investments in, in pre-op imaging storage. And so you know, I think one of the problems we have to solve is, is how are we going to balance the cost benefit analysis of, of the cost of acquiring and storing this data versus the benefits that we can bring together? So if you think about then digital surgery, you know, what are these, these value propositions? And we've, like many people have mapped out this space. And on the left-hand side, you can see, you know, a number of different types of applications of where you can use data in surgery. And, and on the right, a number of the companies that have been focused on this particular space. And while there are no unicorns on the right, I mean, there have been some successes. Um, probably the most recent big success was a company called Digital Surgery which the, with their touch surgical system, which uh, was acquired for half a billion dollars. So a mini unicorn. Um, so you're starting to see some success, a lot of money going into this, 
but you're not seeing the revenue coming out of these products yet. Right now, these are being perceived as add-ons to either an existing robotic system or an existing EHR system. So as we think about how we can monetize and develop the commercial models that are gonna drive this, there's still quite a bit of work that, that needs to be done. One example is a company that we've invested in. And so you know, if you think about that framework, we've started on the bottom left um, at Sante. Uh, Kila is a company that's basically trying to prevent uh, surgical complications by analyzing perioperative data, managing that against a very large $4 million, pa $4 million patient da data set, and predicting complications and recommending interventions for patients to prevent these outcomes. So again, probably on the lowest end in terms of you know, you know, computational requirements for artificial intelligence, but um, you know, we felt you know, kind of where the market is today is something that, that could be ready for hospital systems to start paying for. So, so in summary, you know, look, we're clearly at a turning point, um, artificial intelligence and medicine. Um, I, I love the hype index. I mean, I, I was around in the dot-coms in the early 90s where every uh, internet company was uh, a dot-com and you know, uh, any company was adding dot-com to, to drive their valuation. And we're currently in that with artificial intelligence. So look, I think we're gonna to continue to see algorithms, but we really need to focus on the business models of these areas. Um, and in surgery in particular, um, we need to learn the market lessons you know, from radiology, from digital pathology, and figure out ways to kind of partner with the surgical societies and such to, to embrace these, in a non, these technologies in a non-threatening way, and to figure out funding mechanisms to be able to allow these technologies to make them the market. And just, you know, I, I love that the, if you think about the progress we've made just in the past 50 years, I mean, this is Fugaku. Um, it's the most recent supercomputer and operates at 415 petaflops, um, which is almost half of the processing power of the human brain. So while we're not there yet in the singularity, we seem to be getting awfully close. So thanks everybody today and um, look forward to some of the questions. Thank you, Dennis. I know that you have a uh, board meeting, uh, probably trying to figure out how to get some revenue from all of this. So uh, we are happy to invest. Exactly. If you find it, <laughs> just, just give us a call. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, uh, that was a fantastic uh, lecture. Um, Pietro, now uh, it's your turn to end up uh, this uh, very dense uh, one hour and a half, even a little longer uh, afternoon of, uh, of lectures. And uh, Bernardo Red introduced you, but I want to say that I, I ran into Pietro in the uh, hallway of the OR and he bumped into me. And actually, he waited for me and he, he, uh, he knew that this whole environment here between IRCAD and IHU was the place to be. And he made the smart choice of doing his PhD very successfully before going into surgery. We need more people like you. Pietro, how can we start a surgical AI project? First of all, let, let me thank you for the fantastic introduction. I don't deserve it in any way. I'm super happy about the, the, the presentation I was asked to prepare. I'm trying to put up my slides. So basically I was asked to try to distill what I've learned in these three years working in between the operating room and the laboratory of Nicolas Padua in a very practical way. So to try to sum up some, uh, some uh, learning. So what is needed to get a surgical AI started? So um, I'll have to start with some disclaimers. The following are going to be very practical tips, and that's because there's no perfect recipe for this. There's no magic bullet and there's no scientific methodology yet to look at it. Of course, for a matter of time, I'm not going to be exhaustive, but it's important to stress that AI is a very fast evolving field very broad, dealing with a lot of different type of data and many different applications. So it wouldn't be possible to be exhaustive. And my, my, my take home message is go are gonna be about how to get started. And uh, this is of course a practical reason, but there is also a very concrete reason that it's been stressed throughout the presentation today. And as in 2021, we don't have a single AI algorithm approved by the, uh, the regulators. So FDA, EMA, EMA in Europe. So no one knows how to be successful in surgical AI. 
And it's not only about the business model, but I do agree with Dennis McWilliams. Then why do we have to speak about that? Well, everyone speaks about that. Everyone claims that there is AI everywhere. At the end of the day, we have to make it real. Actually, there is a very practical motivation also here. This is data from an analysis of surgery from Marcusani appeared in 2016. Basically, they wanted to look about the factors influencing the, uh, a successful clinical translation of a medical device. So they looked at every paper presenting a new medical device, and then they screened the literature after 10 years, uh, 10 years, 15 years, to find the report of a first in Newman study. So they saw that overall, the chances of translating a device are pretty low, about 11%, if I'm not wrong. And then they looked at factors that influence this outcome. And basically, they found out that when a clinician is not involved in the development of a tool, the chances of having a first in humans are 3%. When you have a clinician in the team from the very beginning, this improved by six times, you get to 15%. So first thing you need to do is to create this team. So this is a very um, often pulled uh, similitude with the Avengers. Here I've tried to assign some names just to spice it up a bit. A couple of them were easy. The surgeon, God, the scientist, some were less easy. But how do we create this team? It's not that trivial. And Nicolas knows, it, knows, it, knows that very well. At the beginning, we had to learn to speak the same language. So we needed to find a common ground. And this requires a reciprocal education. On one side, which I'm not gonna speak about, engineers need to understand clinical needs and constraints. On the other side, as clinicians, we need to learn how to pose a question, a clinical need in a way that it's addressable by engineers and by this technique. The best way is to study. So I've seen in the chat, there is a lot of question. Do I need to learn how to code? Do I uh, uh, need to learn how to use common frameworks for AI? That's a tough question and I don't have a clear answer. It depends on how much you want to get involved. But there are starting to be opportunities for um, clinicians willing to start this journey, both with generic courses about AI in healthcare, but also at, at, uh, uh, some more specific to surgery courses are starting to appear. And a great example is the, the book edited by Dan, who, were, who where we were lucky to contribute a chapter on deep learning. Then a very important point, which was briefly touched by, by Nicola already, is that we need to create occasion to meet. Occasion to meet right now are a little bit limited to uh, various centers like Irka de Niashu, where this uh, relationship has been going on for years. But more and more surgical societies, and I can cite a few here you can see, are starting to integrate and welcome engineers and dedicate sessions to this. And as was mentioned by Nicola, also the biomedical community is starting to do that. We are, we are very happy to be organizing the first clinical day at Mikai. Mikai is a very important conference of medical imaging analysis. And this is gonna be um, this September in Strasbourg. And that's its only clinician led presentation. Well, I invite the, the interested people to submit there. Second point is what everyone speaks about is this famous big data, 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 data everywhere. But I'm, go I'm gonna make a point that it's how to use the data that really matters. So again, there is no uh, scientific guidelines on how to look at data, but we can make uh, uh, some rule of thumbs, some empirical checklist. First thing, if you want AI to perform a task, you need to make sure that the data are informative about that task. So uh, a very uh, trivial way to find out, it's very superficial again, is to ask, to ask an expert to do so. 
for instance, when, uh, when Bernard d'Alemagne first suggested uh, me to look at CVS, at the critical view of safety, we needed to identify some data to, to train a machine for that. And basically, if he or other experts are comfortable in assessing this with that data, so that information, then a machine is likely to be able to do so. Even better, and it's a, and it's a very fast growing field, would be to use clinical outcomes, which are our, ex, our, I would say, our gold standards if we want to build a system of clinical value. Then we have to make sure that our data are trustworthy. And this is very important and is where um, other AI tools have failed so when trying to translate. Because there is the general assumption that uh, the, surgery, the, the clinical workflow in general is quite linear and clinician inputted data are trustworthy, which very often, and uh, I imagine that every clinician knows that, that's not true because errors can happen. Then the data needs to be representative. And that's also a major bottleneck of AI tools that have been tried to, in the clinics. What does it mean? It means that the data on which the AI was trained, was developed, needs to be somehow similar to the type of patient and the type of disease you see in your practice. You will, not, uh, you will have a drop in performance if the development data set and the application data set differ too much, as uh, happened uh, with the example made by Toby Collins on skin lesion detection. Then you have to look at data. So how much data is necessary? That's the first question everyone knows, uh, ask. Again, there's no direct answer, but there is a way to look at it. And I'll make, the use, I'll make use of the example of the skin lesion detection. If we want to classify a lesion as benign, benign or malignant, and these appear very different, so there is a large interclass by, uh, difference, then you need less data because it's more trivial, the task. If, however, there are tons of uh, uh, potential appearance of malignant uh, skin lesion, then you need more data for the machine to learn how, to, how this, uh, all these different appearances. Last, which is uh, quite interesting, uh, in my opinion, is that sometimes we should optimize data. So we should make sure that our data present the most uh, are, 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 um, facilitate the AI task. This means, for instance, for the critical view safety, we had a very imbalanced data set. So we had very low achievement of the critical view safety, and that's been reported in the literature largely. So we designed the study that uh, Nicola Padua showed in which we improved a clinical outcome. So we improved CVS achievement rate, but at the same time, we gave better data for our AI to learn. And the same can be said with the project that we have done with uh, Professor Perretta and, uh, and Toby Collins on assessment of flexible endoscopy skill. Then we wanted to automatically assess peg transfer. We looked at the box and uh, we wanted to improve the information the machine to learn on in a very simple way. We just colored the pegs uh, that, so that the machine has more information to understand when you move it. And this gets to the last point. AI development is very, uh, it's an iterative process. It's not a linear process by any means. And this somehow answers the question of the many that have been asking how you get, get involved. There are many different levels to get involved. No, I mean, I'm not suggesting to everyone to do a PhD and stay away from the clinic. But what I'm suggesting is that we need this back and forth in between the operating room and the, the development, the, the lab. This example basically is what Nicolas uh, Padua showed. So I came here December 2018, proposing to improve surgical safety, uh, assessing surgical skills. 
Bernard D'Aleman told me, you're going to generate a, a big clinical discussion. So pick some, fa- something where all the clinical communities agree, the clinical biosafety. Okay, then you start to look at what data you have, and you start publishing about the clinical value about, of clinical biosafety. Then you are tasked to annotate this data. So you want to validate a system to assess clinically the critical view of safety and so on. But this can get messy because you start to move in between clinical papers, technical papers, speaking with clinicians, speaking with engineers, and this is reductive because then you start also to uh, speak with regulators and so on. But I think that that's the most interesting and far fun part of the work. With this, I conclude with my three main message, which after the previous talk are gonna look very simple, but I I would say that that's the most valuable thing I've learned in these three years. You need to build a team. This team needs to be, needs to communicate, communicate effectively and needs to be aligned towards a common objective, even though the rewards are different because what an engineer might find interesting at times it's very different from what a clinician might find interesting. You have to work on your data a lot, and not only from an engineering point of view, but also from a surgical point of view. And this means that you need to go back and forth a lot. So on how to succeed, we will speak about this another time when we find it out. Thanks. Thank, thank you very much, Pietro. This is, this is true life. And I, I can confirm that uh, Pietro is opening the door of my office I think 10 times a day uh, for three years, <laughs> for three years. So uh, the exchange are, are permanent uh, to try to improve the value of the data, the way to analyze, etc. So <clears throat> he mentioned very well that it's a very uh, important uh, team process uh, to be succeed. Uh, Silvana, you have some question to Pietro? Yeah, no, I just a congratulation, uh, very nice lecture. I uh, just have one comment, don't forget the patients in the equation because communication between engineers and clinician, fantastic, but the patient is the end user of all of this together with the physician. So uh, don't forget to put the patient in the equation. And I just have a reminder for everybody, don't forget to uh, fill in the survey that has been sent again in the chat. We have more than 300 um, uh, people that already uh, completed it. Uh, We would like to have 5,000 like the people that are attending now. So go ahead do it. Don't do it twice, though, just once. Okay, thank you, Silvana. And uh, again, we're going to the moderator room with uh, Rita and uh, Maria. So uh, I think that they've collect and uh, assembly some questions because there are a lot of questions about ethics, uh, privacy, etc. And we this, these questions were addressed during the different tools, and we don't have true answers today. So it's an ongoing process. Um, so we will focus a little bit more, maybe on more technical question, I would say. So Rita. Yes, Professor, thank you. Amazing presentation, Pietro, congratulations. We have a question regarding uh, what are the efforts that you consider we have to do uh, to retrieve this data, like computer tools, clinical training, and the advices you have for the people who get into the data and collect. And as another another perspective, uh, we have uh, several questions regard, regarding the, the post-operative uh, follow-up or the outpatient follow-up. Is there a way to to, to, to treat this data, to stratify this information with artificial intelligence? So Pietro, first uh, response. Well, thanks Rita. So how to collect data? That's a very clinical task and it depends on what you want to do with the data. What I'd suggest is to um, formalize your research question ahead of starting collecting data. That will give you a better idea of what kind of data you want to collect and how to optimally collect it. What about the, about uh, how to collect more complex data? So for instance, follow-up data, that's a very, um, a very good point. And it's what we actually miss 
in my opinion, in, to get the whole picture of the surgical cycle of care. But there is also there a lot of uh, um, possible solution that goes from what is now called digitalized surgery. So some way to uh, improve patient pathways once they, they, after surgery, but also to monitor this data from remote. So there is a whole movement um, with different names, trial at home and so on, that is uh, advocating for using wearables to monitor patient after they are discharged. And of course, that would be very valuable for AI development. I, I think that uh, Dan is still with us. So uh, same questions for, for Dan, uh, would be very interesting to have his opinion. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think um, all the points that Pietro brought up were fantastic. I think the, the data collection part is really the hardest part of, of this whole process. I think there, there's a piece actually, um, I was privileged to be asked to write a commentary on the paper that Pietro published uh, in, the, in Annals of Surgery about identifying the critical view of safety. And I think that the technology is of course coming around and, and people like Nicola and Pietro are really generating the evidence that shows this works. Now the question is, will the system let us learn from the video? We have a culture in surgery that sometimes prevents us from having the time or the, or the will to go back and, and record and review these videos. We now have the technology that makes it more efficient. So now the question is, will the regulators, the administrators um, allow us to take advantage of this valuable data uh, to, uh, to, to help our patients? Because as Professor Peretta pointed out, it's the patient that's really at the center of all this and the reason why we're doing all of this. And so this is really instrumental or key for clinicians to really come together and, and, and really push uh, to use this data, even if not for AI, just for our own education and for our own self-improvement so that we can eventually begin to use AI to make that process more efficient. Andrew, you have some comment on that? Okay, uh, I have a question because we're talking about, uh, we have a comment about, ah, oh, Toby, Toby. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. It's all right. Uh, I, I've moved to the moderators. It's, it's like it, it feels like the green room, you know, where uh, in, you moved uh, with the girls. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, so what I was going to say is um, if we look to some of the other well, the great successes in applying machine learning, not in the medical domain where data collection is easier, that everyone is reaching for what we call the virtuous cycle, which means once you've got a, a system deployed which has value, um, it gets used. And when it gets used, even if it's not perfect, um, we can gather data whilst it's being deployed to retrain and improve. So when we're in the context of a support system where the machine is not making critical decisions, and so a failure is tolerable, um, when the uh, clinician notices that it's not actually giving the right answer, uh, and so overrides, that piece of information can be fed back in to retrain. And, and this is really the key to unlocking uh, a fast, fast uh, R&D cycle and rapid improvement. So as soon as we can actually reach a virtuous cycle in surgery, I think you're gonna see an acceleration of, uh, of, uh, of, of performance and, and deployment uh, for sure. Thank you, Toby. Silvana? Question, but uh, I think we are a little bit. Uh, are you on more question, Rita? Go ahead. More question. Uh, we have a previous question regarding uh, cholecystectomies uh, because we are focused on the operative data. But uh, some participants ask about what, uh, what what about preparative data? Is this important to prevent and then to go directly to surgery with uh, an algorithm that will allow us to to see the patient as a potential with a potential complication? And the other will be, uh, we have been focused on cholecystectomy, but uh, what about other, other topics, other subspecialities? Dan, uh, you addressed a little bit that during your talk. So can you answer this question, this first question? Yes, absolutely. In fact, actually for uh, our most recent research project, which um, 
is actually generously supported by our malpractice insurance carrier for our health system, was to actually take that preoperative data that we're able to acquire from the electronic medical record and combine it with the video data um, to really try to get insights into what is the risk of developing a complication. And it's not just about identifying common bowel duct injury, but it's just thinking about all complications in general. So Thomas Ward has done some really phenomenal work with Yutong Ban, who's our PhD postdoc in computer science, um, on looking at how the video augments the preoperative risk prediction that we are able to attain using a combination of things like the ACS NewsQuip database um, and other sort of some of the proprietary algorithms that we use at Mass General to do preoperative risk stratification. So absolutely, I think using all of the data available to you is absolutely critical. And then to the point of expanding beyond cholecystectomy, um, certainly our group has done a lot of work in bariatric surgery, now in colorectal and thoracic surgery as well. Uh, and of course, various types of endoscopy. So the, the, your imagination is your limit as to the application. So Rita, if I'm right, there was also a question regarding the potential applications of AI in other disciplines, that's right? Yes, exactly. We have some gynecologists. So what are the, your recommendations? Concrete and saying what's going on in these specialties, that's right? Yes, how to apply artificial intelligence to other specialities, but I, I, I consider this like what are the efforts uh, where should be put on, no? because we have a, a bunch of uh, specialities and diseases. So what do you consider is a good point to start? Like, for example, when we have COVID, I can remember we came up with uh, the ideas of artificial intelligence uh, improving the diagnosis by by instance yeah so andrew you have the you yeah. have the editor so you know everything no no it's not that it's just that you know i hear a lot of uh, fear about artificial intelligence surgery and, and uh, one of the points of having the journal is I, I think surgeons need to embrace artificial intelligence surgery and gynecologists for instance or pathologists instead of having to spend their day looking at thousands or hundreds of pap smears they can have artificial intelligence look at pap smears more rapidly so that they have more time to spend on more complicated, otherwise known as more interesting cases. So, you know, I, I think the, the, the fear against, uh, I forget, what's that event when the machines take over? There's a term for that I can't remember right now. The, the singularity. I think, I think surgeons are afraid of the singularity when we're no longer needed. You know, the, the, the goal of artificial intelligence, why it should be embraced is to get rid of the monotony, the, 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 the uninteresting repetitive actions of surgery so that we can focus and have more time to talk to our patients, you know, which is really the best part of it. Yes, uh, you wanna comment? Yeah, I wanted to comment the, uh, to stress the comment of Andrew, which is a really, really important point. We have to look at it, not, as we've been doing so far, it's not AI versus the clinicians. Unfortunately, there are too many papers looking at AI versus radiologists, which is the most advanced field for now. Honestly, I don't think that that's the way we're gonna use this instrument in the near future. And this is well exemplified by the amazing work that Dan and Dana Shimot and his team, Osmirailis and Yutong, and uh, all of them, Thomas Ward, of course. What they do is they try to deliver the right information to the clinician at the right time. So to make the whole process more efficient. So not to divide AI and clinician, but to complement the two in order to make our work more effective and potentially more safe. I don't know if you on, uh, on the webinar, <clears throat> Nicola Padua, is still there? He, no, he, he had to go to a meeting. Can, can no. I just add, add one more point, actually, about the gynecology in particular? So um, one thing that hasn't really been mentioned or, or, or discussed in this uh, uh, in detail really is, is this concept of augmented surgical vision as well. So, um, for example, I, I worked quite a lot on uh, uh, in gynecology actually before coming to ARCAD where we were creating a system to uh, super, uh, to, to visualize where um, myomas were inside the uterus to, to ensure better uh, myomectomies. And uh, this involves uh, 
certainly artificial intelligence to understand where the uh, uh, what the shape of the uterus is and how to do uh, a visualization. And specifically, it actually relates to a previous question, which is preoperative data. So, in fact, if we ever, if we want to uh, visualize subsurface structures, uh, we, we we need to align this preoperative data to the interoperative data. This is this is a very technically difficult, and this we haven't really had so much success stories in this uh, either. Um, so, artificial intelligence plays a really important role in that. Um, so I just wanted to add that dimension to the discussion that there's a preoperative data and surgical vision uh, is, 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 is a wonderful, huge application area of AI in itself. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Toby. I think that uh, at least in, in our spirit here in the institution is uh, two points. Is first is uh, the support of the surgeon during surgery, uh, which was the aim of the uh, CVS uh, concept. Uh, just trying to apply guidelines and uh, help the surgeons to apply guidelines. So it's to improve the quality of surgery and reproducibility of surgery. That's probably where we can use this uh, support. And I think it's very important. Uh, together with the use of AI on uh, education. And uh, we're also looking at different works on education because uh, you can support the education, and we know today that it's quite difficult, limitation of hours, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So training people is a is a major issue when we're talking about surgery. So probably uh, that will be also a, an important role for for uh, intelligence artific artificial intelligence. Uh, I don't know, uh, uh, Dan. I think that when looking at your work, it's quite the same uh, spirit of development today. Yes, I think I think so. And I think, um, you know, I, I really sort of take a lot of lessons from the work that's been done by Nicola and the team at ERCAD. I think when I um, think about where's the epicenter of a lot of this work, it's where you guys are sitting, because you guys have this unique seat at the table, where you're doing so much of the clinical work, so much of the computational work, and so much of the education, which is so key. And I think that ERCAD has really brought together the community in a, in a unique way, because of the expertise that you have there available to you, like Toby and Nicola Pietro, uh, the surgical expertise that you and Silvana and Professor Moresco bring, that uh, that's what we need, is we need groups like ERCAT to convene the whole worldwide community to tackle this problem. This is something that's going to be tackled at the community level of surgeons, patients, um, engineers, data science, statisticians. So really thank you for, for bringing that approach uh, to everybody here. Yeah, yeah. that's a quite nice conclusion. <laughs> so I think the time is passing. I don't know if any of you have uh, some uh, additional comments. Pietro? Pietro wants always to comment. Always. No, <laughs> I just want to invite you to, um, to fill in the survey, which touches all of these still open issues in, uh, in, AI, in surgical AI development, the one we've been discussing, the role the, the most important uh, applications. You can find that on web search and it's important to better understand surgeon perspectives because at the end of the day, it's the surgeons, the patient that are gonna benefit of it. Yes, Pietro, thank you. Now everybody has to do it because otherwise he will go on and we will have uh, <laughs> this conversation over and over again, including, including the faculty that's there, that's uh, laughing at me now, but it's true. So thank you very much for having spent the last couple of hours with us. Uh, you know that uh, you have to fill this survey, but you also have to buy Dan's book and read Andrew's <laughs> journal. And uh, let us know if uh, you want to have another uh, conversation, uh, fire chat. Uh, with us uh, uh, on this uh, and uh, on this uh, on this topic, I think that it's time to stop it because everybody is uh, making jokes in our room. But uh, thank you very very much. Uh, it was lovely to be with you, and I really hope we can have an actual on-site meeting with all the uh, speakers and why not the participants. Thank you very much. Thank be you. safe and goodbye. Thank you.